Following the Battle of Marignano, it seemed that King Francis I had all of northern Italy under his thumb, thanks to his alliance with the Venetians and his good relations with Pope Leo X. But this control would soon be challenged by a new European power, created from the union of two states under the rule of the von Habsburg dynasty. The conflict would start a century-long rivalry between the Valois and the Habsburgs over the hegemony of Central Europe and the rule of Christendom, and the arena of the initial showdown would be Italy. Maybe this period would have been less complicated if the various monarchs had kept their calm, and it's a good idea in the modern age too. That's where our sponsor Endel can help. It's an app that provides personalized soundscapes to alter your mood, helping with anxiety, productivity, creativity, and getting to sleep. Their AI-powered program incorporates real-time information, such as your heart rate and the weather, to perfect its soundscapes, staying in tune with your circadian rhythms all day to improve the effect and make you feel better both night and day. Neuroscientific studies found it was a fast and consistent way to access the desired state of mind. Use its three modes, relax, focus, or sleep, to feel calm and safe, to enable lengthy concentration or be soothed into a deep sleep. And afterwards, wake up easy with its smart alarm feature that gradually wakes you up in a healthy fashion. You're in control of your mental state with Endel. Support our channel and get a special offer by being one of the first 100 people to use our link in the description. You will get a free week of audio experiences with Endel, so check it out now. The Habsburg rise to the Spanish throne was not a planned one. When Philip the Handsome, Duke of Burgundy, married Joanna of Castile in 1496, she was not the first in the succession line. But by 1500, a series of deaths in her family made her heir presumptive to the Iberian monarchies. However, Joanna was soon declared mentally infirm and was locked up for the rest of her life in a castle. Following the deaths of her mother, Isabel of Castile, and her husband, Philip, her father, Ferdinand of Aragon, was made governor and regent of Castile until their heir, Charles, would come of age. He had been raised by his aunt, Margaret, in the Low Countries. When Ferdinand died in 1516, his nephew, Charles, became king of Castile and Aragon at the age of 15. He was able to take control of the kingdoms, and in August of 1516, he stipulated the Treaty of Noyon with Francis, dividing Italy into two spheres of influence, a northern French and a southern Spanish, while Verona was surrendered to the Venetians. In January of 1519, the old emperor Maximilian died. The imperial crown was not inherited like other titles, but one was elected to the position by the seven imperial electors, the tired Archduke had pooled all his remaining resources to get his grandson elected, but the French King Francis also threw his hat in the ring for the throne. He believed that only with the imperial crown could he secure his grasp over Italy, so he profused large sums of money to the imperial electors. Charles, with an agreement with the Fugger banker family, gave out promises of gifts to the electors if he would receive the imperial crown. The electors, who were already worried about the strength of the French king and wanted a Germanic emperor, gladly took the French money and then voted for Charles to maximize their profits, thus electing him in June 1519. Following the imperial election, Pope Leo wagered his bets. In Germany, the ideas to reform the church spread by the Saxon preacher Martin Luther were gaining traction and Charles was the perfect candidate to keep the unity of the church. Leo was also worried that the young emperor would retaliate against him as he had supported the Duke of Saxony in the imperial election, and the emperor could easily strike at Rome. At the same time, he was still officially allied with the French king, but the latter's holding of Parma and Piacenza, and the unwillingness to lift his protection over Ferrara, conflicted with the pope's interests. So Leo decided to ally himself with Charles, who promised him to combat the heresy in Germany, to give Parma and Piacenza to the Pope, and to let him annex Ferrara. In exchange, the Pope would finance the costs of war to expel the French from Lombardy, replacing them with a Sforza prince, 
and would allow Charles to keep simultaneously the crown of Naples and the imperial crown. War was brewing once again in Italy. The alliance was signed in May 1521, but already in February, Francis had funded expeditions against Charles in Spain and Luxembourg. Taking advantage of unrest in Spain, the king sent André de Foix to help the King of Navarra, Henry d'Albret, retake the region of his kingdom under Spanish control. They conquered the citadel Pamplona and took control of the kingdom, but after having resolved the internal rebellion, in June, a strong Castilian counterattack beat them back in the Battle of Noain. In autumn, a second French attack took Fuentarabia and the castle of Amayur, but did not advance further. Francis also financed Robert de Lamarck's attack on Luxembourg, which was thwarted by an imperial army under Henry of Nassau, and the Duke of Helra's struggle to keep his independence, a conflict that had taken place for over two decades. Nassau pushed into northern France and tried to take the castle of Mezières, but unable to do that, he retreated and conquered Tournai. Both Charles and Francis had assembled their armies at the border of Flanders, but the rains of autumn discouraged further conflicts. The campaign in Italy started with a failed attempt to take Genoa and crushed revolts in Milan. The governor of Milan, Ode de Foix, Viscount of Lautrec, was commanding the French army in Italy. On the other side, Prospero Colonna was placed in overall command of the Allied armies. Federico Gonzaga and Francesco Guicciardini commanded the papal soldiers, while the Marquis of Pescara and de Leyva commanded the Spanish. The Swiss Confederacy had agreements with both the Pope and the King of France to send mercenaries, and so they did. Once the army had assembled, Colonna commenced his attack in August by besieging Parma, defended by Lautrec's brother, the Viscount of Lesca, but the approach of the French army forced him to retreat. In October, the Spanish Papal Army crossed the Po River behind the French and was later joined by their Swiss allies, though some of them went to defend Papal territories to not infringe the Pact of Neutrality with the French King. The French army, which was hemorrhaging Swiss mercenaries, retreated behind the River Adda and, after being unable to stop the enemy crossing at Vaprio, backed up to Milan. Heavily outnumbered, the French and Venetian forces fled the city after the Milanese population revolted, who then welcomed with open arms Colonna's army on the 20th of November, and soon the rest of the duchy came under their control. Francesco Sforza, the second son of Ludovico il Moro, was declared duke, while papal forces reconquered Emilia. The enthusiasm for the expulsion of the French was lost following the death of Pope Leo X on the 1st of December 1521. With his death, a new conclave, plagued by hyper-partisan cardinals of the imperial and French factions, elected Charles V's former tutor as Adrian VI in January of 1522. As the newly elected pontiff only reached Rome at the end of August, the state was managed by the clergy. This gave the possibility to many nobles to recover lost territory and positions, such as Della Rovere, who recovered his duchy and fomented conflict in central Italy in the following spring. With the death of the de' Medici Pope, many of their soldiers and funds for the war effort disappeared, so Colonna had to dismiss many of his Swiss mercenaries. Now that there were fewer defenders in Lombardy, the French and Venetians recommenced operations by attacking Parma, successfully defended by Guicciardini. Fortunately for the French, a contingent of 16,000 Swiss entered Lombardy and the able light cavalry commander Giovanni della Bandinere joined the French. Colonna meticulously prepared the defense of Milan, locating the French defenders in the castle of Milan, and was joined by 4,000 German mercenaries. Once joined by the Venetians and the Swiss, Lautrec crossed the river Adda and approached Milan, but the stout defense of Colonna and population repelled the French army. Meanwhile, Francesco Sforza had finally departed Trent with 6,000 German mercenaries and had reached Pavia. Lautrec moved south to attempt to cut off their way to Milan and sent Lescun to Novara, who successfully assaulted the town, but still Sforza slipped through. Lautrec, seeing an opportunity, battered on the doors of Pavia, but Colonna, after a first unsuccessful relief attempt, 
exited Milan with all of his army, forcing the French to leave camp and move to Monza. As often was the case in these campaigns, the coffers of the French army were drying up and the Milanese had cut their supply lines. The Swiss grew ever more impatient and threatened to leave, so Lautrec ordered to attack on the 27th of April the fortified Allied position, going against his better judgement. His adversaries had followed the French army and were now encamped 5 kilometers north of Milan at the manor house of La Bicocca, surrounded by ditches and marshes in a strong defensive position, making it impossible for the strong French cavalry to complete a pincer move. Colonna positioned the arquebuses and cannons behind a ditch and embankment, supported by Spanish pikes and German lansquenets. His men-at-arms were in the back as reserve, far from enemy artillery to not have another situation like at Ravenna, while his Milanese allies were arriving from the capital. Following a short skirmish between the light horses, the Swiss mercenaries advanced, full with audacity and ferocity on their own insistence, convinced that they would roll over their foes, as so many other times had happened. They were accompanied by a number of French knights on foot, while on their left, Lescure commanded a contingent of lances and the Venetians were left in reserve. The Swiss pikes dashed recklessly against the enemy line, but unfortunately for them, for the first time the arquebuses were used in a systematic way. Four lines of shooters advanced, retreated and ducked, allowing their companions to reload. The compact Helvetic battalions crumbled under the heavy fire, and the few that reached the top of the last embankment were met by the heavy pikes who cut to pieces their enemies and gave the Lansconnects the chance to have revenge on their rivals. In the back, the French cavalry crossed a stone bridge, but found only moderate success in the enemy encampment, and the knights who made it to the baggage train were pushed away by the Spanish cavalry, so Lescure had to withdraw across the bridge, while the Milanese nearly encircled him. The Swiss mercenaries were soundly defeated, and their confidence took a great hit. The French lost at least 3,000 men in front of the enemy trench, including many commanders, while the Allies' casualties were negligible. Following the defeat at La Bicocca, Lautrec could do little but retreat. His Swiss allies went back to their homes, and only a few cities remained in French hands, so he returned back to France to notify on the situation, soon followed by his brother Lescun. Prospero Colonna ordered not to pursue the enemies, assuming correctly that the French could not hold on to Lombardy, and instead concentrated his efforts on assaulting Genoa, bringing the mercantile city into imperial folds in August. Charles and his closest advisor, Mucurino di Gattinara, took advantage of their position to pressure the Italian states to contribute to the war effort and pay for his troops. In August, Pope Adrian finally arrived in Rome, but he surprisingly refused to be dictated by the imperial envoys sent to him. Frictions arose between them around the quartering of troops and the fate of the Deste family, and most importantly, the Pope hoped to broker a peace between the two monarchs to instead focus on the Ottoman Turks, who in the same year conquered the island of Rhodes and invaded Hungary. Only when Francis declared himself hostile to this compromise did he cave in and formed an alliance with the Emperor, the Italian States and Henry of England, who had already supported the Spanish war effort the previous year, while Venice signed a peace agreement with the Emperor, disassociating with the French. This was not the only setback for Francis. He had prepared a grand army to continue the conflict in Italy, and he was going to lead it personally. But in the summer of 1523, he was kept in his kingdom by the threat of Spanish attacks in the south, an English raid in Picardy, and not least the rebellion of the Duke of Bourbon, the greatest feudal lord in his kingdom. Bourbon was unable to successfully invade Burgundy with German mercenaries as his conspiracy was uncovered, so he instead escaped to Charles's court. Meanwhile, a French army, now led by the seigneur of Bonnevay, crossed the Alps in September and forced the river Ticino. Prospero Colonna retreated to Milan and prepared for another siege that lasted until the middle of November, though many smaller skirmishes continued to take place in Lombardy. 
The Spanish leader died that December 1523 after a long illness. One of the last great Italian condottieri and the Viceroy of Naples, Charles de Lannoy, took over his command. In November, Giulio de' Medici was proclaimed Pope Clement VII after his predecessor had died two months before. During the winter, reinforcements arrived at Milan, while French reinforcements and supply lines were cut, thinning their ranks. After having wasted his funds and men, Bonnivet retreated behind the Ticino with his army in a bad shape and was pressured by his adversaries. As they retreated back to France, the main force was intercepted while crossing the river Sessia on the 29th of April 1524. In the Battle of Romagnano, the Spanish light cavalry and arquebusiers skirmished with the retreating enemies, killing the famed knight Bayard and taking the French artillery. Following the battle, the last French cities in Italy were taken. To follow up on the imperial success, Charles of Bourbon and the Marquis of Pescara traversed the Alps to occupy Provence, taking all the major towns, including the capital, Aix. Only Marseille stoutly resisted for over a month, and when the French king himself approached with a powerful army, the Imperials lifted their siege and rapidly turned back by the end of September. Francis, enraged by the attack on the French heartland and Bourbon's treachery, rushed into the Po Valley with his 40,000 men to take advantage of the situation. The Imperials were unable to put up any resistance and retreated to Lodi, leaving Antonio de Leva with 6,000 men, mostly German, to guard Pavia. By the 25th of October, Francis's vanguard reached Milan, which was struck by a tremendous plague and in no shape to pose any resistance, so the keys to the city were surrendered. Francis, instead of pursuing the enemy forces, as suggested by his more experienced commanders, headed to the second city of the duchy, Pavia, which he started to besiege on the 28th of October. Francis surrounded the city with his army, positioning himself to the west of it. On the first day, he built two batteries to tear down the walls. After two days of bombardments, they breached the walls, but de la Via's lands connects and the local population repelled the attack. During November, he had his engineers attempt to divert the Tacchino River into the Gravelloni riverbed and then to attack the weaker southern side of the city. But the heavy winter rains swelled the river, destroying their progress. De la Via still had difficulties paying his troops, which he partially solved by using the valuables of the churches of the city and by assassinating the German commander. With the Kingdom of Naples left defenseless by the Spaniards, Francis saw an opportunity to retake the kingdom that had once been the main objective of the Italian wars. He sent the Marquis of Saluzzo to secure Genoa, and a contingent of around 6,000 men under John Stuart, Duke of Albany, to the south. They were joined at Lucca by another 3,000 infantry, and continued south towards Siena and Lazio, where the Orsini and Colonna were assembling more men. Meanwhile, Charles' army was waiting for reinforcements, but the Venetians were not budging from their positions, while the Pope took an ambiguous stance towards the two monarchs, first inviting Francis to Naples and then pleading him to retreat. Giovanni delle Bandinere once again switched sides and joined the French, but Charles of Bourbon finally arrived with 6,000 lands connects and 5,000 Netherland horses, bolstering the imperial numbers up to around 20,000 men. The Marquis of Pescara took command and sprang into action, marching to Pavia, arriving there on the 5th of February, and setting camp east of the park north of the city. The French army had continued the winter siege, detrimental to the morale of the troops, passively blocking the entrances to the city. Francis was sure he could starve out the city and would not wait for spring. When the imperial army came, Francis rearranged his camp in a more defensible position along the Venacula Brook, and for three weeks smaller raids and skirmishes took place. During these three weeks, the condottiero Giovanni della Bandinere was injured in a sally of the garrison, thus leaving him to recuperate with most of his men, while 6,000 Greece's mercenaries were recalled to defend their homeland. As the French had just lost 8,000 men in a week, 
the imperial commanders decided to strike before their own army dissolved because funds had dried up. A small contingent of Spanish cavalry managed to disguise themselves and entered Pavia to give the orders to the garrison. By the 23rd of February, the imperial army was composed of around 17,000 infantry from Spain, Italy and Germany, 1,000 men-at-arms and light cavalry, and 17 cannons, while the garrison in Pavia numbered around 6,000 men. The French army numbered around 18,000 infantry from Switzerland, Germany, Italy and France, 1,300 men-at-arms and 53 cannons. Pescara would take command of the battle on the imperial side and ordered on the evening of the 23rd of February to move north along the wall while the artillery in the camp continued to fire. Silently, a group of engineers spent all night destroying the wall of the Park of Mirabello, an old hunting ground built by the Visconti north of Pavia, creating a number of breaches. The French knew that the Imperials were on the move, but they believed they were retreating back to Milan. Francis felt secure behind the walls and did not believe an attack was coming, as he thought it would be too audacious. At around 5 a.m. on the 24th of February, a vanguard of 3,000 arquebuses under the Marquis del Vasto silently entered first into the park and moved towards Castel Mirabello, where it was believed Francis was located, with the goal of capturing him. Once they reached Mirabello, they stormed the castle and took the camp inhabited by army followers, filled with merchants, cooks and prostitutes, who were slaughtered, starting to loot the camp until their commanders brought them back in line. At the same time, a contingent of French scouts under Tiercelon had spotted the unusual noises and had reported back to camp. Tiercelon then rode with 1,000 light cavalry to harass the enemies who were setting themselves up, capturing the enemy light artillery and skirmishing with their counterparts. More and more Imperial soldiers came into the park and came into line. Francis was woken by his guards and ordered his gendarme to prepare for a charge the finest nobles of the realm would march with their king, and around 900 formed up around him. The morning fog and the uneven terrain of the park reduced the visibility of the battlefield, and the French had difficulty discerning their adversaries. Whether because Francis believed that the enemy in front of him was just a smaller diversionary contingent, or because he had to give time for his infantry to form up, the French king ordered a charge. The wall of iron smashed into the imperial cavalry who could do little against their better armoured counterparts and were dispersed. Around this time, three cannon shots were fired from the camp. It was the signal for the garrison to sally out against the besiegers, this way cutting off the French soldiers south of the main camp from the rest of the army. Suddenly, the French knights, isolated from their infantry and believing they had won the battle, were assailed by Del Vasto's arquebuses who had returned to the main army and were mowed down volley after volley. The French king fought with valour as his retinue sacrificed themselves for the safety of the king, who got trapped under his horse after an arquebus shot killed it. To the east, the German Landsknechts and Spanish infantry began a fierce melee against the Flemish Landsknechts of the Black Band and a contingent of Swiss mercenaries. The two bands of Landsknechts hated each other as the Black Band soldiers were considered traitors and the casualty number was high. What broke the French infantry was the arrival of the garrison of Pavia from the rear, which crushed the formation. Francis and his surviving knights surrendered to the Spanish cavalry under Delanois, who even had to kill a few of their own infantry to save the king and took him to a nearby farmstead. The French infantry that did not participate tried to escape over the Tequino River, many drowning. The survivors were taken by the Duke of Alençon, who had not participated in the battle for unknown reasons, and headed north. By 9 o'clock, the French army had lost between six and 9,000 soldiers, while the Imperials lost only around 1,000. Many of the French commanders were either killed or captured, beheading temporarily the French state of its leadership. Francis wrote to his mother, I have lost everything except my life and honour. And now that he was imprisoned, Charles had all the cards in his hands.
This seemed like the end of the Italian Wars, but that wasn't the case, and more episodes about these conflicts are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.